Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. We have Dr. Cameron Webb. Welcome, brother. Thanks so much for having me. How you doing, King? He's the uh, senior policy advisor for equity on White House COVID nineteen task force. What, what does that yeah, mean? What does that mean? Yeah, that was the first question I asked when mm-hmm. uh, when the administration asked me to come in in this role because equity means different things to different people. Mm-hmm. But I think from my perspective and I think the perspective of the vice president and the president, it's making sure that everyone in every community has the opportunity to achieve their best health. And in this pandemic, it means not just to you know, survive, but hopefully thrive. You know, it's been a tough moment for a lot they, of people. They're attaching that word equity to a lot of things. I don't know yeah. if they should be attaching that word equity to. You saw what happened last week when they, uh, what was it, the, when, they, when they said it was crack pipes. But it was safe yeah. smoking supply kits, whatever yeah. you want to call it, syringes and all that. And they attached racial equity to that, too. Why are they attaching equity to all these things? Yeah, I think, I think you know, different things become buzzwords at different times, mm-hmm. right? And I think that for a long time we talked about disparities, inequalities. And now I think people are focused on this notion of equity, and appropriately so, right? Equity mm-hmm. means that, you know, you're not doing the same thing for everybody, but you're finding ways to write systemic you know, inequalities that have existed over time. Mm-hmm. And, and, and to do that, you have to make sure that you tailor strategies uh, in different directions. So I think that's the notion. That's an it's an underpinning of a lot of what the administration aims to do. But as much as it's a it's an animating principle for the administration, it's a buzzword that a lot of people attack otherwise. And I think that's why the piece with the crack pipes, it was it was just a, a straight up attack, you know, mm-hmm. for not for good reasons. So what's we the, know how this things go. What's the COVID nineteen task force? What what is that task force? Because it seems like, you know, we've been we say one thing, then we bring it back, then we say another thing, then we say, oops, we were wrong, then we say something, then it, it changes so much. So what is the COVID-19 task force, and what is it supposed to do? Yeah, so in the, in the White House COVID response team, it's really kind of the core entity coordinating across government. So, you know, um, there are a couple of different pieces, and when you mentioned task force, there there was a health equity task force specifically on the White, that the president initiated, and Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith was leading that. So their role over the course of 2021 was to convene experts, work with communities, really identify what is going to help us to to really uh, accomplish this goal of health equity, health equity specifically within the context of the pandemic. And so they issued their final report in November. So that was the health equity task force. The COVID response team is is more so just the the quarterback of the effort. So we work with CDC, we work with, you know, all the different pieces of HHS, we work with other components of the White House and other agencies to say what is it that we can do that we can leverage from your agency, your office to help advance the goals of, of really eliminating or addressing this pandemic. Now, we see cases dropping all across the country, but they say it's still higher than they were this time last year. So yeah. what, what what is that? Has herd immunity kicked in or what is it? Well, you know, I think Omicron was, was a unique monster. You know, I mean, it, it showed up and we just saw cases spike. And I, I work clinically in the hospital, so I work as an internal medicine doctor. And, you know, even on the floor, we just started seeing record numbers of patients coming in. Mm-hmm. And these were folks who had you know, navigated this pandemic for a year and a half and then all of a sudden coming in uh, sick with COVID. And I think that you see the cases spike. You know, I, I dug into the data and, and it really peaked among you know, black folks 18 to 39 in, in southern states. Mm-hmm. And I think you see the, the combination of the lack of mitigation measures like masks, like you know, some of the, the physical distancing and avoiding crowded indoor spaces, the impact of the, the booster effort, right? Because when you have disproportionality with boosters, then you see that manifest in hospitalization rates. So the cases were concerning. The hospitalizations were really concerning. We had mm-hmm. four times the hospitalization rate in the black community uh, just over the last few weeks. And so when I hear people saying the pandemic's over, I'm just like, I don't know what pandemic you're watching. But, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, you know, all the stuff that they're talking, but then you see certain governors in certain states saying they're taking the mass mandates off. Then, right. um, you know, even airports, when you're flying at one time, you know, there was a middle, there was a seat between everybody for social distancing. Now they're cramming people in like sardines. Like, so... What do what should people believe? Because they change things so much. They do in a, a couple of things. First, people say you know they, they change recommendations a lot, and that's true. Uh, just the same way the weatherman changes the recommendations of what you should wear in December versus June, right? They think the environment changes, and that's why recommendations change along with it. But that being said, you know I don't want to lean into like false equivalency. We say this is what's happening in hospitals, therefore what's happening in communities. You know, I'll give the example from my own family. I have two kids. One six, one is ten. Right. For my two kids, even if the governor in Virginia is saying, oh, kids don't need to wear masks, my kids are going to be wearing masks. Mm -hmm. And the reason isn't just that it's going to protect their health and well-being. It's that my wife's an emergency doc with the work she does and the work that I do. We can't afford for our kids to be out of school for five to 10 days because they caught COVID. Right. So we're going to do everything we can to protect them. And I, I think for people who 
can't afford to miss work for a week and a half, keep your kids protected, right? Like this is, these are mitigation strategies that are rooted in public health that just make sense. And so while some governors are relaxing these mandates, the thing I keep reminding people is nobody's saying you cannot wear masks. What they're saying is that they're not mandating masks in indoor spaces, but like Floyd Mayweather said, protect yourself at all times, right? Like you really have to have that mentality in this world. You know, do you, do you feel like America proved over the past couple of years, we're not ready for this. We're not ready for any kind of pandemic. Everybody, from the media to the medical system to just regular citizens, nobody is ready for this. 100% we weren't ready for it. And I think part of it is the way that in our politics, we talk about public health when you have a crisis like this. So you've heard people talk about public health for the last couple of years. But fast forward a couple of years, they're going to forget about it. You know, unless somebody changes the mentality, even in the Affordable Care Act, there were billions of dollars each year for public health. They started cutting that money just three years later and, mm-hmm. and using it for other purposes. You have to think of pandemic preparedness of public health more broadly, the way we think about our military. Nobody ever talks about, oh, we're going to completely defund or cut back on the military preparedness. You always need to be prepared for a battle, and public health is the same way. And so hopefully we learn that lesson uh, the hard way this time. But again, I think it's going to require people saying we, we require more from our government in terms of maintaining I, our public health. I often wonder if this pandemic hadn't have happened in a presidential election year, would everything have been different? Especially yeah. the information, you know, a lot of it got politicized, it got weaponized. You know, when you talk about the response to vaccines, like, yo, that's the time where there shouldn't be anybody opposed. Like, everybody right. should be on all hands on deck to say, you know what, let's get the best vaccine out here. It doesn't matter who's in, who's in office. But you had people that are in office now. Biden's, you know, Kamala's saying, who's going to take this damn vaccine when it was the other side pushing it? But when they got in office, now you got to convince these same people you told not to take it to take it. Don't you think that was a misstep? Well, I think that, you know, your your words matter, your language matters. And I think that a lot of people's concerns about the prior administration were rooted in the way they politicized the CDC, right? Mm -hmm. And you you have this entity that's meant to be science-based, science-driven, and that's what undermines a lot of that public faith. I think what happens, and it's funny because a lot of times when I talk to people about the vaccines, I'm in rural Virginia, you know, so a lot of times I tell folks, uh, you know, oh, yeah, that vaccine that Trump, that Trump started, yeah, you know, he got the vaccines out, and now we're making sure everybody can access them. And it kind of takes people off base because they're like, wait a minute, okay, so should I be against this if Trump's the one who, who mm-hmm. established it? Right, you have to cut through a lot of the, the politicization of it. And I think that you're right, because it was an election year, everything is political. Mm-hmm. Right? And then you put that in our, our hyper-politicized environment generally. And I think some people, they don't even know what message they're supposed to be arguing for. They're just like, I'm against it because it's not my side who's pushing it. You know, So so I think it's, it's, it's disappointing. But I think one thing we've done in the Biden administration since you know, we came in last January was we said, we're going to let the, our true north be the science and be CDC. And we're not going to intervene. We're going to let them follow the science. And I'll tell you, that's hard sometimes to, to sit back and get their guidance and not drive it. But again, it's what I think is in the best interest of the public. You just can't politicize matters of life and death. You, you absolutely can't. Absolutely what, can. What's your thoughts on, on mandating the vaccine? You know, some people, are, if they don't have the vaccine, their jobs are firing. And what's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think if you look back at, at work requirements, for instance, you know, we put those in place last summer. And uh, and my, my first thought on it is I was like, well, there's a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's rooted in people's confidence. We have to do the hard work of really talking to folks. We had 90 million people who weren't vaccinated at that point in time. You, you fast forward six months, seven months, and we're down to 30 million. 60 million people were vaccinated in that time just from those requirements. And then Omicron hit, mm-hmm. right? And when Omicron hit, we had far fewer hospitalizations and deaths than we would have had but for those vaccinations. You know, you look at things like the flu. We have about 50% of people nationwide who get the flu vaccine. It's not mandated. 40% of black folks. But you look at COVID, 84% of black people have gotten the COVID vaccine. Wow. And so, you know, and that's 85 percent of white people, 86 percent of Latino individuals. So this is unprecedented levels, not only of vaccination rates, but of equity in terms of those vaccination rates. And I look at that and I say, it's not just numbers. Those are lives saved. Those are people who aren't in my hospital. So so, you know, as a as a physician, I'll tell you, I'm glad more people are protected than than would have been the case. Uh, I think that you know the Supreme Court made the decision they made on work requirements. But I think that at the end of the day, these requirements have saved lives. And they work. And for people who get protected, you know, that that benefit accrues over time. They have that immunologic protection they carry with them every single day. What about, what's your thoughts on kids getting the vaccination? You know, I, I got sick. So at first I was a little scared, a little nervous um, because, you know, I just felt like it wasn't tested enough for children. Um, I wound up do it. You know, do I, I did get it for my, my older kids. But, you know, it, it was still a little nerve wracking. 
Yeah. Well, so I mentioned I have a six year old and a ten year old, and I remember when my daughter Avery was born. Uh, I'm a I'm a whole doctor, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember the first time they showed up to put a shot in her arm, I was like, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, you know, mm-hmm. like she's she's straight from God, like you know, this child hadn't been touched by anything. Mm-hmm. Now he's starting to put shot. But again, I had to remind myself this is part of my being a good parent is making sure we're using all the tools we have of today to protect her from the worst of what can happen. You know, those same two kids, they got vaccinated as soon as possible from COVID. Mm-hmm. And in large part, it was because for my wife and I, we work on the front lines in the hospital. We were always worried about bringing something home to those kids, you know? And so I think that, you know, from our perspective, there were there was a process that led us to that decision. We, we don't just follow, go with the flow. We said, well, where's the data? And if you dig into the data, uh, the data on kids 5 to 11 was fantastic. Remember that the dose for adults, uh, for Pfizer, for instance, was 30 micrograms. Mm-hmm. For kids, it was 10 micrograms. So it was one third of the dose, reduced the side effects significantly. And in the side effects, I'm talking about headaches, I'm talking about muscle pain, stuff like that. My kids didn't have any of that when they got vaccinated. But even a step farther, you realize that it's really effective because kids have a really robust immune system. So not only was it you know safer from a side effect standpoint, but it was just as as good the immunogenicity of, of promoting a good immunologic response and so from that i'm like my kids are getting the best of two worlds here and what's crazy is that you know when omicron hit and kids all across their school are getting covid my kids are fine through it right mm-hmm. because they wear masks because they were vaccinated that's those are layers of protection that we're grateful for but even that information was kind of confusing because i remember when they was telling us you know covid doesn't affect kids at all and then it was just like just all of a sudden, one day, it was like, you got to go out there and get your kids vaccinated. Yeah, you, you got to, what I always tell people is, um, you know, don't, you got to you gotta listen to the messenger, right? Don't let people tell tell the story, because if they say it's not affecting kids, it sure was affecting black kids. You know, you look at the, the rate of deaths, there were more deaths in black children than there were white children, several times more, right? COVID was in the top 10 causes of death for kids before the vaccines came out. So people will create a narrative just to further their their point, but... The truth of the matter is COVID has affected kids this entire time. And not only just that, right? So Fauci lied. Sanjay Fauci Gupta lied. No, it's, it's context, right? It's okay. not, these aren't lies. Like the context is if people say, are we seeing kids in ICUs to the same rate that we're seeing 75-year-olds? No, right? Okay. But I think for a lot of, like people like to boil things down into really simple terms. It's really complex concepts, right? But there are a few things. So, so today, if you ask me, what's the risk of, of COVID-19 versus the flu in kids? I would say in terms of severe illness, they're relatively similar. But in terms of long COVID, I don't know. And one thing mm-hmm. I want to protect my kids from are the lingering and long-term effects of COVID, right? So so those are things where it's like, and, and also remember, data continues to evolve. We continue to get new information as this pandemic goes on. So the information that Fauci had back in March of 2020 versus March of 21 versus next month, March of 22, completely different. So you're saying that in March of 2020, the information he dispensed uh, could have been considered misinformation now. I think it would be considered information that has that has been updated, right? Because mm-hmm. if, in March of 2020, we had just started to see cases. By 21, we had seen cases, but we hadn't seen what vaccines were going to be able to do, and we hadn't seen some of these uh, some of these variants. And now, March of 22, we've seen variants. We've seen two years worth of effects. Of, mm-hmm. But there's just way more information, and I think that's that's the thing. People, there's not a lot of grace in our society for that. You know, but I think that if you're a scientist, when you, the way you look at this, you're like, of course we're going to learn stuff over time. Of course we're going to get new mm-hmm. data. Of course there are going to be new articles. Of course that's going to update the way we treat people. That's that's science. That's how yeah, I, I mean, Fauci said, I mean, at one point Fauci said, don't wear a mask. He said, mask only for health care yeah. professionals. And I think people see that. And, and you know, what you're, what you're speaking to is kind of how that undermines some confidence, right? For everybody who's keeping track and has a list of, you said this this day and then that changed, you know, they're just like, I don't know if I can trust you. It's funny, I, I did some focus groups uh, working with the Department of Health and Human Services on unvaccinated young black people. I was like, what, what are your reasons? What are you concerned about? And they're like, well, people keep saying different things. I don't feel like I can trust government. I don't feel like I can, I can trust you know, any politicians. And we're like, well, who do you feel like you can trust? People are saying nobody. That's real. And, and it's just like, that's 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 so disappointing, you know, and it's, it is real. But at the same time, you know, I think about the work I've done in community long before I was in government and the way that community members look to me then and continue to look to providers in their own community. They'll say they don't trust anybody, but they'll know their local doctor, the person who's like in their neighborhood. And they'll be like, let me call up so-and-so and and find out what's real. Right. We still have that dynamic. We know that local trusted messengers make the difference. But I think that's what happens when you're communicating like nationally for something that's very local, very individual. Not everything applies to one person. I was going to ask, you know, we we talk about healthcare workers and 
when COVID first happened, the pandemic first happened, a lot of them were on the front lines. There was no vaccine, and a lot of them died. A lot of them lost their life. A lot of them went into work and not knowing what was going to happen. Now, fast forward a little bit. Now they're saying if a lot of them don't get their vaccination, they're going to be fired. What do, what do you say to that? Because they put their lives on the line when there was no vaccination. I am them. Right? So you're talking That's about right. me. You <laughs> you're talking about me. But then and some of them people didn't, and they don't believe in it. They don't want to. But now we just firing them and just throwing them away. But before they were, we honored them. We, we loved them. They were heroes. And now it's like, oh, you're gone? You see, and, and again, let's, let's tell the facts, right? Because people will try to tell you a story. Over 98% of healthcare workers are vaccinated, right? It's a, it's a great majority of healthcare workers are vaccinated. And this isn't new to us. Mm-hmm. Every single year, they make me get what? My flu shot. If I don't have my flu shot, I got to talk to somebody. That's a problem. Every time they're somebody asking say me. say a flu shot has been tested, it's been tried, it's yearly. Fully FDA approved. Mm-hmm. This COVID vaccine is fully approved, right? And if you, so if you ask me that question January of last year, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, these are new vaccines, I'd give you that. I'd grant you that, right? We're talking about a vaccine that passed the same gold standard as the diabetes medicine you use, the asthma medicine you use. You don't think twice before you take a, a puff of that albuterol, but this is a vaccine that has passed that rigorous evaluation process, right? And so I think for a lot of people, it's not because the data on the vaccines themselves is a little shaky. It's because of this narrative that's been weaved for the last year and a half that just undermines a lot of public confidence. We have those conversations. I think at the end of the day, there are people who are always going to make decisions that they think is in their best interest. And if that impacts their employment, then that's their decision to make, right? But at the end of the day, as a healthcare worker, I know that it's not my, I don't have the, the right to bring illness in when people are sick, right? Mm-hmm. The patients I was taking care of over the weekend, those individuals who were already sick, I can't bring COVID to them. My coworkers who are working their butts off for the last two years, I can't get them sick with COVID after they've been doing everything to protect themselves just because they're in the the physician's lounge with me and I happen to have COVID, right? So we have to create safe environments and healthcare spaces. That's not new to COVID. That's something we've always held. People politicize it more. It's more charged in COVID. And you've got 330 million people who we're talking about intervening on right now in this moment. Whereas for some other things, if it's your measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, everybody got that when they got it. Their tetanus, they got that when they got it, right? This is all at once. And that's what creates this kind of this this like, frenzy all at once. What do you say to people who feel like, oh, well, you know, there's people out there getting the vaccine, but they're still catching COVID and they're still getting sick and you can still Something pass, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, yeah. the vaccine, which was another thing that you could say was misinformation because people told us that couldn't happen. It's, it's heartbreaking. And, you know, I think that that's one of the things that, that is, is so frustrating to me because on the front end, you know, I was one of those hopeful people, right? When I got vaccinated on December 17th of 2020, I was hopeful that this was going to prevent me from getting COVID, you know, forevermore, right? That's just not what the data ended up bearing out. What the what the studies did for that vaccine is they said, I'm much less likely to be hospitalized or die from COVID. But we said, but I'm also less likely to transmit it or to get COVID as well. Ultimately, I think a couple of things blew the lid off that. You look at Omicron, so many people were getting COVID. Again, I'm always reminded how many people would have died from COVID if it weren't for vaccines. Or, you know, the, the primary endpoint of those studies was looking at death and hospitalization. We still saw a lot of hospitalization, but those hospitalizations would have been deaths, right? Those cases would have been hospitalizations. The, the benefit of the vaccines is it limited the severity of the illness. And that's just part of it, right? I think, you know, I look at other pieces, you know, there, there are conversations that we have because we feel like, oh, we're all, we're all healthy and well. There are people walking around who look just like you and me, uh, who, who are living their everyday lives, but they also are immunocompromised. They're also dealing with a new cancer diagnosis. Part of our obligation, our responsibility is to keep in mind, there are folks who don't have the benefit of all the, the opportunities we have to work from home, who don't have the benefit of, of some of the different medications or the, you know, and whatnot. And for them, this idea of vaccines, it's truly life-saving for them. And if as a society, we're not taking care of or thinking about or, or prioritizing the ability to keep society safe, that's a problem, right? And especially in the black community, right? 14% of us are, are disabled. In the black community, we carry more chronic medical conditions. So when we see even vaccinated folks now who are being hospitalized, you know, over the age of 65, the black individuals over 65 carry more chronic illness into that, that and hospitalization. What's, and what's your thoughts on the COVID pill? I know, I know we had to go, but the oh, yeah. COVID pill, the new pill that they're saying, what's your thoughts on that? I, well, you know, we're in New York, so it's a different conversation here. I think it's it, 90% reduction in hospitalization and mortality. So it's it's really beneficial. So what is the COVID pill for people that don't know? So there are two of them right now, one called Monopiravir from Merck, one called Paxlovid from Pfizer. The Paxlovid, we, so as a government, we got 20 million doses of that, 
right? So that was a, a big deal. What it does is it makes it so that you take that pill within five days of getting a COVID diagnosis. It decreases your likelihood of hospitalization and death. Now, the people who should take it are folks who are at risk for severe disease, so have different chronic conditions, things that put them at increased risk. Um, you know, one of the big things is making sure that right now it takes a while to make those drugs. This drug didn't even exist, wasn't even dreamed up this time last year. So Pfizer is actively making these pills. But in the meantime, we have very few of them. So what New York has done is they said, we're going to prioritize the risk factors that put people at greater risk for severe COVID, one of them being race and ethnicity, right? And that's created a, a storm because everything's politicized because people take that and they say, oh, now you're discriminating against white people. No, anybody who has a risk factor that puts them at severe risk, at risk for severe COVID should have access to these medications. They can save their lives, keep them out of the hospital. So, so I think that this has the potential to be huge because then what we focus on is getting people tested. And that's why we have covidtests.gov and we're getting tests out to people. That's why private insurance is requiring tests. Medicare is getting tested to people. Medicaid is getting tested to people. Making sure people can know whether or not they have COVID and go from there and get the treatments. That they need. Do you, um, well, I, I know you got to go, but do you, do you think there's power in just simply saying, I don't know? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you've been a physician for any period of time, that, that's critical. You know, I, my, my barber shop in Charlottesville is called the Barber's Den. And every time I go there, like sit down in the chair, you know how the barber shop is. Mm-hmm. They're just like, Cam, I got a question. And people just start, you know, rapid firing around the shop. And what's interesting is so often I'm just like, I don't know the answer to that, right? That inspires confidence that's because right. then they know that what I'm saying, if I tell them something that's factual, they're just like, I trust him because when he doesn't know, he says, I don't know. Right. That's something you have to learn to do. Some people aren't comfortable doing it. But I think that at the end of the day, that's it's critical for for encouraging, inspiring confidence for people. Especially in this era of, you know, there's always a camera in your face. Right. You know what I mean? Like if you're putting somebody on TV every day, they got to say something. Right. So sometimes they can say, I don't know. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, Dr. Cameron Webb, we appreciate you for joining us. And thank you for spitting some facts. For sure. Nice Come up anytime, you. man. Will do. All right. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. 